Well, uh, so this is the final session of the uh, the Agile MSP. We're going to talk about engineers' workflows and and also the specialized workflows. It's something I've alluded to over the last couple of weeks, maybe once or twice, but I haven't said anything about it. And it's a really powerful technique that you can use. It's it's really interesting. I think uh, I think you'll like to hear about that. Even if you don't maybe use that technique right away. Uh, then it's good to keep in the back of your mind because it can be a really effective way to get even better visualization into some of how, how your work is going than just some of the, the other ways that I've described to you so far. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, just as always, yeah, if you can go on your camera, that'd be great. Love to see how you smile. Uh, again, interrupt me with questions. Toss them in chat. I'll try to keep an eye on that. And uh, def definitely have some questions throughout. Uh, and at the end as well, type of questions. I just want to mention uh, something that someone else has said about working through top left. I might have said this before, but basically uh, a comment we've had before is, uh, it's weird that this is the exact same data in a new visual form, but suddenly everybody knows which tickets should have been closed when they just didn't with ConnectWise. These folks closed almost 300 older finished tickets out of 450. So I don't know if you've ever seen that as ConnectWise users, just tickets can stay open for a long time. It's not true. You're not actually look, working on these things, but because the data, the ConnectWise just doesn't give you a great visualization of the data, things just stay open. It messes up all your reports and it uh, distracts you and and whatever. So it's it's very powerful to have a better way to see those things. Sometimes it just makes those problems go away. <clears throat> okay. So some of the learning outcomes here for today are uh, we're gonna look at how engineers perform their daily work according to Kanban principles using Kanban boards, and then identify specialized workflows that you might have in your MSP, be able to document the, uh, the stages of those specialized workflow and see and know how you'd put that on a Kanban board. Okay, so just a reminder from some of the last sessions here is uh, we had talked about when customers get the value from the work that you've done, which is, as we said before, right at the very end when you, when, uh, you actually change that Ticket status over to complete, and that's when the customer gets their value out of it. Meaning, we want to get as many things to complete as we can as fast as possible. Uh, we talked about some some of the early stages of work, like uh, in in uh, help desk, how that has to do with service and triage and dispatch. And then last week we talked about the early stages of the work being uh, the project planning. We talked about some of the dispatch methods, like uh, the technician queue, where everybody has their own queue of work. We talked about the team queue where you just make one tier, uh, one queue for the whole team. That sometimes it has to do with tiers that you might have already set up in your teams. Uh, we also have talked about calendar scheduling and when to do that. And also about monitoring for problems in your work right now and uh, some ways to resolve those sorts of things. Okay, so I just want to take a minute and check in and see uh, how things are going for you. We had talked a bit um, about uh, last week. The homework, I think, was to uh, let's remind myself. Uh, use top left for some of the backlog estimation and dispatch and resource planning in your projects. And uh, when you make new tickets for your projects, make sure that you're using good scope practices there. You know, you're not making tickets that are too small or too huge. And uh, thinking about where the bottleneck is in your project, like in your engineering workflows there. So, um, how how did that go specifically? Uh, did let's talk about actually the uh, scoping practices. Did anybody need to go through and and scope out tickets for any projects over the last week? Uh, so, Matt, I think we probably kind of mentioned that this is new to us. Um, so, we got some demo licenses for the guys yesterday. So, um, people haven't really had a chance to do anything with it yet because they've only just come in. Um, sure, but you but, you don't need. I mean, I'm not asking. I'm I'm not actually asking how you're using top left. I'm actually I'm asking how are you actually doing when you do project management? Like, did you try that? Right, so, so as far as the the ticket thing was actually a big big thing that we we have an issue with at the moment. Um, is that projects are either too micro detailed in tickets or just one general ticket that bucket of time that happens. It's hard to manage the budget then on what's going on. Sure. So we have been talking about how to utilize that. Um, so 
while we can't give evidence that we've been doing what you what you've said, we have certainly introduced that in, and it's going to become part of our workflow from now on. Um, Perfect. To make things better. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. Glad to hear that. <clears throat> I'm kind of asked that question because it's it is something we hear about pretty frequently. Like. Pr if I exclude all of the questions I get about like the top left software in particular, in terms of all the questions I get in, in sort of project management stuff in general, that's probably one of the top tickets. Like, how do we split out the work of the tickets into you know, uh, reasonable sizes? So uh, definitely a lot of people struggling with that. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're, uh, you're able to planning to put some of those practices, put some of those things into practice. <clears throat> okay. Show. Okay. I uh, just want to talk a bit about the engineer's workflow. As I mentioned, we've talked about the early stages of the work quite a bit now. You know, we've spent at least two weeks, and even uh, like the first week, um, talking about some things related to that. Uh, so, so we've really covered thoroughly the beginning parts of the work, but we haven't really said too much about how the engineers work. So. That's what let's let's talk about now. Um, there are two main types of work, as we've talked about. So you know, scheduled work and queued work. Um, the scheduled work is stuff that is only there uh, because uh, is only in the calendar because of the nature of the work or the customer's needs, right? So we're not we're not putting everything in the calendar like maybe you used to, just because that's how you manage the work. No, we only put it in there if it's got to be coordinated with somebody or between two or more people so it should go in the calendar or you know or it's you justifiable by the nature of the work uh, otherwise it doesn't get put in the calendar it just goes in the queue which you see in top left so um, those are the two types of work the uh, the engineers find that work in then two places so the scheduled work they find in their calendar they can also see it in uh, I, I you know if it's in a calendar it should also be the ticket should be in the scheduled status and then that would show up in the scheduled column in top left. For the queued work, they find that in top left. Obviously, that's not on the calendar at all. So they uh, find that just in top left in a ready status. Uh, I should say ready. Yeah, yeah, probably in the ready status, and in uh, and then in the ready column, there in in top left. So uh, just as a reminder, the when you're using this Kanban flow for work, most of the engineer's time is not scheduled. Um, compare and that contrast that with other ways of working. You know, the typical we put everything in the calendar, where an engineer's day is you know 90 percent scheduled out. They uh, they really don't have any time that's not scheduled. In this mode, most of their day is going to be unscheduled, and so they do actually have substantial time to uh, to work through that that queue of work. Uh, now, I should mention one exception to that could be that if you have a de like a dedicated on-site te te technician or like team of technicians, people who are dedicated to going on site for customers. Um, if it's someone like that, then you know, probably most of their day, day is scheduled. So I'm not, yeah, just, you know, consider when there could be exceptions. I'm not trying to say like, there's no exceptions and every, every engineer should, uh, should have most of their day unscheduled. It depends on the role. I'm talking kind of, you know, in general, most MSPs, engineers will have uh, a lot of their time not scheduled on, on the calendar. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what, how do they actually work? Well, first of all, they follow their cal calendar. If this is a typical engineer. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, lot about the Kanban boards, but actually they're kind of their first priority is to follow the calendar because that's got the stuff that says, you know, this is important to do at, 1 p.m. on Thursday. So they're going to be looking at their calendar, and they can also see that work in, in top left in the right in the scheduled column. So that's our top priority. This so is the second priority is uh, during any unscheduled work time. That's when they look for that. Uh, then they work through the queue of work as it's displayed in in top left. Now, particularly during those unscheduled times, uh, they work from the on the board. They when they're looking at the Kanban board when they're thinking about, okay, what ticket do I do now? They work from right to left. So basically they start at the, the rightmost column on the board. And uh, if there's, 
nothing there, then they move on to the next one from the right. Choose something from that. Do that. Move it over to the right. Um, and then within a column, if there's more than one ticket, then they work it from top to bottom because those ought to be ranked uh, in importance from top to bottom. So one way to remember this is on a Kanban board, like if you pretend these are columns on a Kanban board, the work itself represented by the cards on the board, uh, the work goes left to right from new towards uh, towards the right where it's complete. Uh, the workers go the opposite way. They work from right to left. So the work itself goes left to right, but the workers, they go right to left. And uh, again, that's because we want to emphasize finishing work rather than starting new work. And so we would prefer to work on the things that are closest to being completed already and those we find on the right side of the board. Okay, now a little bit of a more, uh, more concrete example here. This is similar to what you would see on a Kanban board. So we have just uh, to describe what we got here. So we have uh, essentially a member swim lane board where we have uh, the, the Kanban board with the columns, new, ready, waiting, scheduled, started, completed, pretty typical. And then the work is split up into who's assigned to uh, to each ticket. So we have some work here in the unassigned swim lane in the new in the new column. And uh, that would be the typical stuff that uh, uh, dispatcher still needs to triage and dispatch, and then they would move them into the ready column and assign either to Alice or Bob. Uh, or other people on the team, you would see that as, uh, you, you'll recognize that as the the technician queue method because each tech has their own queue of work. So what can they actually do here? So, um, you know, if suppose uh, Alice is looking for something new to do, well, how does she work? Well, uh, Alice would, you know, so, supposing Alice comes in in the morning looking for some new work to do, looks at the board like this. Um, starting at the right column is uh, there is something in the completed column but you know completed column obviously that that's always that's already done so we don't do anything there I mean half the time people don't even have a completed column on their boards anyway that's uh, that you'd only do that if you really want to have a place where you can review the completed work so it's totally personal preference if you actually want to have a completed column on the board some people just exclude it uh, so then there's a column for started also called in progress sometimes. So uh, Alice, since um, she's not going to do anything in the completed column, obviously, comes to the next right column and finds two tickets there. So uh, she can't start new work. She's, Alice is not going to go all over to the ready column here and then pick something, uh, pick whatever's at the top and then pull it into started because Alice already has two things that are in progress. So Alice may not start anything new. She needs to work on one of these tickets. In, on a top left Kanban board, then they would be ranked as well. And she would work particularly whatever's at the top. Um, the, uh, let's talk about Bob, though. Uh, if Bob comes in in the morning, Bob uh, also takes a look at the completed columns. It's not going to do anything there. Uh, but look at started column. Uh, you want to go to that game, too, when you're down. So you are sure. Need to, uh, you know, I'm just going to mute everybody. You're welcome to. I'm getting some background noise there. You're welcome to take yourself off mute if you need to. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so Bob has no tickets in started, so he is good to start some new work. So uh, he would look over at the scheduled, uh, nothing there that needs to be done. Waiting, he might take a quick look at the waiting column. Uh, nothing there is ready, actually ready to work at all is still waiting. So he is free to go over to the ready column and pick what's at the top, drag that over to the started column and begin working on that. So that is uh, how Bob would work. So um, just a couple of notes about uh, some of these columns um, in, in, in progress or started. Um, this is one you really want to watch out for. Kind of the main things. This is where work in progress lives. And uh, so you definitely want to be careful about that. This is, as we talked about, especially in the first week, like work in progress just kills your productivity. It makes customers uh, just uncertain about when you're actually going to deliver anything. So we really want to keep that to a minimum. <clears throat> so, And this is what you're looking at, basically. How many cards are in a started column for any particular person? So uh, that's 
if you look for any one thing on a board like this, that's it. Try to keep this down to a minimum, the number of uh, started or in progress tickets. Uh, for the scheduled column, uh, you th this is where someone would see uh, what what is in the calendar for today potentially. Uh, it could it could be scheduled out beyond today as well. So uh, keep an eye on that because that'll tell you what things um, you do need to do today at a certain time. Make sure that each ticket here that's in scheduled has a entry on the calendar. Uh, it would be an error to put something in scheduled when it's not actually scheduled in the calendar. So that's something to watch out for. Uh, waiting tickets. Uh, what The only thing that you need to review for a w tickets in the waiting column are uh, two things. One is if some, whatever you're waiting for has actually happened. Uh, you know, maybe you're waiting for a part in the mail and it arrived. Maybe you're waiting for the customer to respond and they responded. Okay, so you do need to review the waiting column from time to time. Def you know, once a day, uh, definitely not more than, or yeah, not less than once a day, a couple times throughout the day. And uh, the second thing that you're looking for is just to see if anything there needs any follow-up. You know, maybe you reached out to a customer about a certain thing you needed to know three days ago, and now it's time to follow up again. So uh, you're in waiting, you're looking for things that have become not waiting anymore because whatever you're waiting for has happened, uh, or things that need more follow-up now. And then uh, ready, that is, uh, that's your queue of work. Uh, by the way, a board like this with the member swim lanes is not actually the best way for an engineer to work. It's it's good for my purposes here in, in describing the different people, but it's not how an engineer would actually work. They would prefer to work from a board, a Kanban board that um, doesn't have any swim lanes at all. And in fact, is filtered to show only their own work. So it's free from distractions. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about how to, how to do that in a bit. Uh, okay, so a couple of... Well, actually, before we get into tips and tricks about specific issues that people run into from time to time, um, any any questions about that workflow, how an engineer or a technician works? Go ahead and unmute yourself or uh, put it in the chat. Let me reopen the chat window here. No, okay. I'm speaking up. You're free to unmute yourself if you need to. Um, yeah, I mean, this is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, there, you know, you can explain how a technician works, and you know, their first, if it's a, suppose it's a new technician who's just hired, you know, you can explain this in five minutes on their first day of work. You know, it is, it is pretty straightforward. Okay. Uh, tips and tricks about some specific things that uh, specific questions that I've heard before. So one is escalation that comes up in every MSP. Basically, take us a bit too hard for a more junior engineer. How do we escalate that up to to a more senior engineer? So, uh, and by the way, this is something that's really hard to generalize. I, you know, I got a couple of suggestions about how to visualize it, but every team has their own methods for how they do that. Uh, you may have really good methods already, and you just need to visualize it. So uh, basically for uh, a small team, uh, a, a team that's not big enough to have like specific tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three, and, and so on, um, you just add a special status and a special column for escalation. Um, you do want to emphasize those tickets. You, know, you want to have a place where it's really easy to see those tickets uh, because they need some special care. Um, but you don't want to have a, too many Kanban boards either, especially if you especially if you don't have any other reason to have any Kanban boards. And we don't need to make new Kanban boards just to show escalated work. That actually makes it harder to see this work if there's a separate place to go and check for that. So ideally, we want to have it on a single board. And uh, the best way to do that that I can suggest is to make a special column, a uh, special status, you know, escalated or whatever you want to call it in your PSA, and then make a special column for that to show those tickets in a dedicated place on the Kanban board. Uh, if it's a larger team, you already have uh, your tiers established, um, then you're probably, you, you are gonna have separate Kanban boards per tier. So um, you might not actually, in that case, your Kanban boards, if they're designed well, they might just have that sort of that uh, visualization of the escalated tickets built into them already, you know, because a ticket that gets is in progress in tier one, if it gets escalated, uh, then it might go back into sort of a 
a dispatch and triage process for tier two once it gets escalated. And that should be, uh, that should already be reflected, that triage and dispatch bit should already be reflected on the Kanban board that the, the tier two team uses. So there might not be anything extra to do there in terms of just getting sure that's, that's visualized. Um, so there's a few different methods you can use. What, the most important thing is just to make sure that it's documented and well understood in your team. Like what is the process to escalate when I need to do so? You want to make sure that those are clear and documented and there's no no uncertainty in your team about how the, how they do that. Um, one other thing I want to mention is something to consider doing, and this is something that our MSP, that we're, you know, that top left came out of, um, what we had been doing was not actually escalating things. Um, if a junior engineer got blocked on something, it was their job not to just kind of hand it off to a senior, but to ask for help from the senior engineers, and then they would learn and then document the solution. So that has led to having us having a pretty large library of SOPs and you know other help and instructions and whatnot, because uh, engineer junior engineers aren't just allowed to you know hand it off and never see that ticket again when they escalate it to a more senior engineer. No, they're going to see the solution because they actually have to rope the more senior engineer in to help them, and then they document the solution. So that is a, a real good practice for uh, improving your documentation and thus improving uh, the training in your team. Okay, so next thing that people have frequently asked about are how do you handle tickets where the customer has responded? Because um, when a customer responds to a ticket, uh, you, you know, pro probably the ticket is in a waiting status, waiting on customer, and on your Kanban board, that would be in the waiting column of the Kanban board. So uh, what happens when a customer responds? Well, it's not waiting anymore. And uh, like I just said, okay, well, like, what do you consider for the waiting tickets? Well, you want to review them from time to time to see if someone's responded. But actually, it would be even better if we could emphasize those kind of automatically so we don't even need to go and check in the waiting column to know when a customer has responded. We can just see that more readily on the Kanban board. That would be even better. So how do we do that? And um, for that, we, we would suggest you use the workflows that are already built into your PSA, whether that's uh, ConnectWise or Autotask or whatever. Uh, they all have workflows that can run when certain events happen. So when a customer responds to that ticket, it changes the ticket status to like customer responded. That's pretty typical. In fact, I've seen this at uh, very many MSPs. I don't know. It might even be built into some of the some of the PSAs because I've seen that part pretty pretty frequently. But one part that I haven't seen so much is uh, that people actually make a dedicated column on their Kanban board for the customer responded tickets. So that'd be the second part of that solution. Is like one is get this special status for customer responded and a workflow that dumps the ticket into customer responded at the right time, and then put that as its own column on the Kanban board. Um, that would be, and actually to be a little bit um, more specific, that the dedicated customer, I just sorry, dedicated column would be my recommendation for um, auto task users. But uh, um, I think we have, you know, we have more ConnectWise users. And right now the top left Kanban Board software supports something additional for ConnectWise that it doesn't for Autotask. And that is a way to uh, use what we call style profiles, which can customize the appearance of a ticket. So if you're on ConnectWise, you can actually, there's an additional option you could use where uh, if a ticket is in the customer responded status, or actually ConnectWise actually has its own just field on the ticket for customer responded. So uh, you could put those into the the same column as the, like, we'll put them into the in progress or the started column so that you know, okay, you know, this is now responded as a technician. I should review the response and see if I can work on that ticket again. So it goes into, puts it into the, not, not a dedicated customer responded column, but rather put it into the started or in progress column. But then you can also apply some additional formatting to it. So you can change the background color to whatever you want. Just kind of emphasize that ticket compared to any of the other ones that might be in in progress or started, just to, to emphasize them and make it more clear, okay, this is a ticket that's already been, uh, you know, you, you've already done some work on this, you were just waiting for the customer and they've responded now, that would be a good one to get to next. Because, uh, you know, who knows, maybe there's, because they've responded, maybe there's just a few more minutes of work to do on that ticket, and then you can knock that off. 
So that's something that you can do in the uh, ConnectWise side of the software. We do intend to bring that sort of functionality to the, the um, every PSA that we support uh, in in due order. And uh, also, you know, typically the MS the uh, the PSAs will be emailing you as well. So um, these are just ways that you can uh, you know visualize that in top left. But you should also keep using the existing tools that you already have, like pay attention in your email. You might see when a customer has responded if your PSE emails you in that case. Okay, uh, another one here is uh, sometimes we get uh, folks have had trouble with is uh, meeting billable targets. So this this might not apply to everybody, but uh, some MSPs have set up some goals so that teams are, are uh, responsible for meeting certain targets in terms of uh, uh, billable hours. Um, as far as that goes, bill, um, meeting those targets is a manager's problem. It's not a you know, it's not a particular engineer's problem. So that should be very clear. Um, engineers should just be working from the top of their queue. Uh, whether the next ticket at the top is billable or not billable isn't really their concern. Um, so it's it's important to just keep those responsibilities clear. Um, another thing to keep in mind there is that the uh, the billable targets should be managed at the whole team level, not at the individual level. So if, if one person is uh, lagging behind on the billable hours, maybe because they've been assigned to do some internal work that's not billable, uh, but the rest of the team is go, um, doing well on their targets, it, you know, that's not really a problem. What We, we don't care if um, not every engineer is like on the same metric in terms of billable hours. We just want to look at it at it at the whole team level. Uh, and then finally, in, in, for this, um, you, you are going to continue using your PSAs reporting for understanding, like, what's your progress towards these um, billable goals for the month or whatever you, however you, you might uh, manage that. Top left isn't, we, we haven't really solved, or, you know, we haven't tried to solve that sort of problem. So you're still going to be using your PSAs tools for looking at that sort of thing. And then you use top left for managing work. Basically, if you're kind of falling behind on the, uh, the billable hours target for the month, well, use top left to put more billable tickets at the top of the queues. If you're doing really well and you say, oh, you know what, maybe it's time to, uh, we, we can justify uh, not doing quite as many billable hours. Let's get some more internal work done. Okay, then go ahead and put internal work at the top of the queues. So top left does have a part to play in this, but also with the existing PSA tools that you already use. Okay. Uh, now, I just want to mention some tools that help engineers visualize their work in top left. Just make sure that uh, nothing is overlooked. So en engineers should know about all these tools. So um, engineers are going to want to use a Kanban board without a swim lane. <clears throat> okay, so in a lot of the examples that I've showed you, we've used like a member swim lane. Um, usually, um, well, I should say all the time, just engineers, they don't need to see the member swim lanes. They, most of the time, they don't need to see everybody else's work. So they're going to find a board without a swim lane. They're going to, you might have seen that there's a button for my tickets at the top of the board. Just click that. That just filters it to show their own work. And then you can actually bookmark the resulting page. And if you look closely, you can see the URL of the page in your browser. It's got that filter applied um, with, you know, it's actually embedded in the URL that there's a filter applied. So you go ahead and bookmark that page, come back to that bookmark, and uh, you get to that board, obviously, but you also get to that filter that's been applied. So you can get there in one click or set it as like a pinned tab in your browser. That's what I do for my own Kanban board. Uh, so that can help you get there really quick. Uh, now, one ex I can say actually a project-focused team uh, may actually use a swim lane. Uh, e even if it's an engineer, they might use a swim lane board, but it's not going to be a member swim lane board. It's just going to be a board with a typical project swim lane, uh, which I had shown some examples of last week, uh, because an, a project engineer can still get a lot of value out of seeing just their work. So it doesn't include all of the work of the team. It's just what they're assigned to, but it does. Uh, it is split out into the different projects that they're responsible for showing the tickets within those projects. So that that is still useful for a project focused engineer. Um, one uh, optimization that you can do for the sake of the engineers is you can have uh, separate boards for the managers and separate boards for the technicians 
Uh, like, for example, one that doesn't have any swim lane, that would be for the technicians. But you don't also you don't have to have the same columns on those boards that are dedicated to the engineers. So you can remove the early columns that uh, for the work that engineers don't need to be concerned about. Like if it's a help desk work, you don't need to be concerned about the new column for the you know, triage and dispatch stuff. Just drop that off the board for the engineers because they don't need to see that as long as they don't have any responsibility for um, picking up tickets on their own like they might in a small team. Uh, same thing for the project work. You know, they don't, might, not need to, might not need to see the backlog column on their board, so just drop that off the board that's intended for the project engineers. Another thing that you should be aware of is for the scheduled work, I've said this a couple times uh, already, that the you can look at the scheduled column to find the work that has been um, scheduled in the calendar in the future. Then there is a um, special bit there. You may have noticed that tickets that are scheduled into the calendar, they will have a little outline around the um, the photo of the person who is assigned. It'll be a blue outline when uh, that ticket is scheduled in the future. Uh, yeah, that's right. A blue outline when it's scheduled in the future, a green outline when it's scheduled today, and a red outline if it's scheduled in the in the past, right? <laughs> because scheduled in the past is a bit of a problem. You need to, it's only useful if things are scheduled in the future. Uh, so it can give you clues there to like, hey, how is our system set up here? Is, is there anything I need to fix about a certain ticket? Like get it scheduled into the future. Um, there's also a, yeah, so those indicators can give you a bit of a clue in the scheduled column about what's coming up soon or maybe what what has passed that we need to maybe reschedule. Uh, there's also a detailed option. So uh, if you're a administrator in your top left, you can turn on the option where it shows uh, those details, um, shows those assignments in a lot more detail. So uh, instead of just being a little indicator with uh, uh, just like the person's photo who's assigned to it, then you can actually show the details. Like this person is assigned in the calendar at uh, Wednesday at 2 to 3 p.m., for example. So it can show those details actually without even, um, uh, you, you don't even have to like hover over the card to see those details. So that is an option that's available on the Kanban boards. Another thing engineers ought to be aware of is that they can drag and drop, you know, obvious Kanban functionality, drag, drag it to uh, uh, between columns, to change those statuses. Uh, they can edit a lot of the key details about the tickets from top left just by clicking on the card, turning up the editor for that ticket. And also we have timers uh, so they can track their time easily and uh, the ability to register and record that time and notes in top left. So all things that I uh, just want to make sure that engineers are aware of that they can do in top left. Uh, and on that note, I, I want to mention too, there's, in terms of the software and uh, what we offer to be able to edit about tickets or, or, or read about tickets in top left, uh, we're, we're never going to be able to get to 100% of what ConnectWise or Autotask or the other PSAs do. Um, but we do want to get enough functionality there that people aren't frequently having to go back to ConnectWise to see a certain thing because we don't support that in top left. So uh, if that is an issue, or you know, as more and more engineers use that, if they have any feedback in that regard, yeah, we would love to know about that. That's going to be uh, one of our real priorities to build that sort of stuff out um, in the near future. So we, we would love for you to let us know about that. If there's some, some particular edit or something you need to view, about a ticket where it's not available in top left, so you got to go back into ConnectWise or whatever to see that. We want to know about those specifics so that we can uh, we can build those out in top left. Okay, um, so that wraps up the engineers bit. I'll talk about the general and specialized boards here in a second, but just want to pause again for any questions. Questions about how engineers work through this on a Kanban board. No, no questions? All right. Uh, well, interrupt me if you do think of something. So now I want to talk about general versus specialized boards. Um, a general board is pretty much the only thing that I've shown you so far. It's like basically everything that I've shown you over the last three weeks is a general board. So that has the typical columns like new, ready, waiting, in progress, and complete. And those, if you think about those stages, new, ready, waiting, in progress, complete, like that can work for just about any workflow at any MSP. It's very, uh, you know, 
is very generic. So we call them generic boards or general boards. The, that's not the only way that you can track the work though. There is a more specialized way to do it. So we, uh, let me introduce to you specialized boards. So that tracks work for one specific workflow. Um, and with that, you can track it in a very, uh, you can visualize the particular stages of work for that workflow from the very beginning to the very end, and then get really good insight into where is all the work that is happening in this workflow? Is it being completed? Is it stalling or, or whatnot? So like, just as an example, let's suppose, suppose that one specialized workflow that most MSPs have is talking about procurement, okay? They gotta buy things for their customers at various times. So, um, and it's uh, useful to be able to visualize, well, where, where are the things, the, the work that we're doing in terms of procurement? So if you think about how you make an order, uh, what are the stages that an order in the procurement workflow goes through? Well, it could be this. So these, these could be the columns of your Kanban board. So one would be like preparing a quote. Okay, so that's the first stage. Uh, next stage would be waiting for the customer's approval of the quote. Uh, next stage would be approved. Okay, the customers approve that, they wanna buy it. Uh, next stage would be order submitted. Stage after that would be it's been shipped. And then after that is it's been received here in our office. So those I mean, those are just examples, right? Because I can't, uh, every MSP is gonna be different. So I can't tell you, oh, the, these should be the steps in your procurement workflow. Like, no, um, you, have a procurement workflow and it may be very different than what I just described. That's just an example, but it gives you an idea of uh, thinking in terms of a specific workflow, what happens in that as it gets from like the very first stages of work until it's done. Typically you are gonna have, uh, if you're gonna do this sort of Kanban board, you're also gonna wanna make sure you have the right statuses in your, uh, uh, in your PSA because you're going to need to keep those statuses uh, you're going to keep need to keep that work in those statuses that reflect the stages of those of that work so um, you are an important part of doing this sort of board is to uh, update the statuses add whatever statuses you need in your psa okay so why would you do this um or like let's, let's kind of contrast them a little bit more like why would you use one board or the other type of board either general boards they are good for work with a lot of high variation so like at a, a typical help desk okay where you handle all different kinds of issues you know you might work on 50 different types of issues in uh in a particular day or even more right uh same thing with a typical help desk you've got one-off projects that just are all sorts of different work so you got a lot of variation there um, a general board can be a good way to track that sort of work. Um, maybe you need to, uh, is, when you use a general board, one, one particular thing to note about that is that the sp specific requirements need to be defined in the ticket description because we're talking about a high variation in the type of work, so each ticket is unique. You need to have a place where you record, okay, what's unique about this ticket? That's gotta go in the ticket description because there's no other place to keep that. Uh, Note that uh, we've talked about this a little bit before, but I'll remind you the columns represent the, the next step of the work. Basically, um, like who who is responsible for the next step of the work? You know, if it's a if it's in the new column on a help desk board, then it, next person responsible is the dispatch person to get it out of new and get it into ready. Once it's in ready, the next step is for the engineer to work on that ticket, pull it into started. Uh, if it's waiting, the next step is for the, uh, well, whoever is responsible for the, next stage of that work to do that, to do whatever work is represented there. So on a general board, the statuses are more talking about the, uh, what's the next step of the work? Um, you know, another way to think about that is um, sometimes it's a little bit hard to order the columns on the board. Uh, for example, if you consider a board with a uh, pretty typical, you know, a waiting column and a scheduled column. Uh, which, if you're thinking in terms of, okay, we want our work to move left to right on the board, so what order should those columns be in? So what is closer to being completed, waiting or scheduled? Well, it can be kind of hard to think about that. There's not a really obvious answer to which stage is closer to being completed, waiting or scheduled, like we don't know. Um, so uh, that's just another uh, kind of side effect of the, the columns on a general board being um, very ge 
generic and not uh, not having really anything to do with like the actual flow of value from brand new to being completed. Um, let's contrast that then with specialized boards. So specialized boards are good for visualizing anything that's repeated overall. So, um, you know, I mentioned procurement already. Another example could be a sales funnel. You know, your sales process is pretty consistent. Um, B, uh, another example would be how you run BTRs, like business technology review. Other people call them like QBRs, quarterly business reviews. Basically, you schedule a meeting every so often with a, with a client just to meet with them, make sure that they uh, are feeling heard, uh, that they are seeing the value that you're providing to them and to, to talk through a new upcoming work, making sure that they're being served really well. So uh, whatever you might call those, um, those you would have a specific practice for how to schedule those, how to run those. So that's a repeating uh, that's a set of repeating work. Um, any sort of repeating projects, like a client onboarding, when you get them all set up on your stack of technology, um, probably you've got a particular process for that sort of thing. So that's that's also a good e example of repeating work. So when you put a card on, uh, let's say you make a ticket on one of, for one of these uh, specialized boards, the cards represent the particular unit of work, let's say. So if you're looking at your sales funnel, a card represents a particular deal. If it's procurement, it's a particular order. Uh, if it's a BTR, then it's like one customer. Who's, you know, what's the customer for this BTR that you're running? Um, so sometimes you don't need to keep much information on that. Um, you don't need to keep much information on that card within the ticket. Like maybe, for example, if it's procurement and you've got an order number, well, maybe the order number is literally the only bit of information that you need to keep on that uh, on that order because uh, you can just take that order number and look it up in one of your procurement systems. And then that's where you find all the more interesting information about that other than what stages is it, is it in. Um, the same thing with a, a sales funnel. You might just track the deal, you know, a bit of information about the, the deal there. The And uh, contrast that with the general boards where all of the details for that particular ticket are stored in the, uh, you know, in the title and the description of that ticket. Because there's no, they're all unique work. There's, there's a lot of unique information about each one of them. There's no other place to look up any of that work. So you got to keep that details on the ticket. But that's not true for the specialized boards. Um, also, the requirements for the um, for each step of that work on a specialized board are defined outside of the ticket. So, for example, when it moves from one stage to the next, you know, certain certain things need to happen for that work for it to move from one stage to the next. And the work that needs to be done for that particular transition doesn't need to be stored on that ticket. Yeah, you're probably not going to store it there. You might store the details of that in an SOP. Uh, for example, maybe you keep a wiki with SOPs, or basically you define, okay, what needs to happen for this workflow for a t for a bit of work to move from that stage to the next. You need to find that somewhere, but it doesn't need to be on the ticket. In fact, it's okay if the description on that ticket's completely blank because you find the details somewhere else. Um, and the most obvious thing about the specialized boards is that the columns do represent the stages of delivering value. So it should always be easy to put them on an order because, as I mentioned in the, you know, like the procurement one, uh, if uh, let me read, I said yeah. So if your stages for procurement are you know preparing the quote, the customer uh, waiting for the customer approval, then they approved it, the order is submitted and it's shipped, then it's received. Well, th that has a very clear order. Um, you know anybody who looks at that system would identify the same uh, ordering among those stages. So. You can get a very clear, uh, you know, left to right flow of that work, and uh, very rarely will anything go backwards on that board. That would be quite unusual for a specialized board. Whereas it's more common on a general board that something does go from right to left, moving kind of backwards. Okay, so some of the advantages here of the specialized boards is that you can get a lot of efficiency out of that. Um, one, just because they're really good at helping you emphasize standard procedures and automation. Uh, because for example, you could actually automate some of the things that move a ticket from one stage to the next. 
um, you know, if it was something, if if it was justified to automate that, because it's taking a lot of time now, and you do it frequently, or or whatever it might be, um, it is possible to sometimes automate those steps. Whereas it's almost impossible to automate things on a general board because they have such a large variety of work. Uh, another way that you can get really good at efficiency is from specializing who works on those boards. Um, on a specialized board, certain um, individuals or certain teams can actually own the work that is in a certain column. Um, where And then you can have different people own different columns or uh, different teams own different columns. And then because that's the only work that they do, or I mean, maybe they also do other work, but you know, they are responsible for that one bit of work. Well, they can get very good at that. And, and so you can, the, the whole system gets more efficient because of that. Um, it's also just really good visualization because uh, compared to the general boards, where, as I said, they just include a whole variety of work. Some of that work is going to be really big. Some of that work, work is going to be really small. Um, on a specialized board, each card represents maybe about the same amount of work. Um, it, not always, like, it, but more so than on a general board. So as an example, uh, like it doesn't necessarily take more work from your team to manage, uh, say, on a procurement board, like a, an order worth $10,000 versus an order worth 50 bucks. Like it might represent the same amount of work for your procurement team. So that's an advantage of specialized boards is that because, you know, it's easier to see how much work you have in total because the cards tend to be uh, a more standard size. Um, also, you can represent the progress better. Basically, the card, the card on the board represents everything that is needed to deliver value to the client, which kind of is, uh, say, opposed to a project board where maybe your project is, is involved in like you got 10 or let's say 15 or 20 different tickets that are part of delivering a project. So just because one of those tickets gets to complete, it doesn't mean anything about how the whole project is progressing. Whereas on this sort of board, that card represents everything about that bit of work. You know, if it's one order or one sales deal or one customer onboarding or whatever. So you know that when that ticket gets to the last column, it's done. Like that whole bit of work is done. So it's, it's a good way to visualize the progress of that work. And then finally, uh, you can make really effective use of the work in progress limits and neglected work thresholds that we offer in, in top left. So um, suppose, uh, so yeah, you can set up work in progress limits for, uh, you know, different for each column. Um, one thing that might, uh, one example of what could happen is that maybe you get a lot of work that's kind of, um, it's been building up on the right side of the board at an early stage for that specialized work. Uh, or sorry, uh, if the right side of the board would be at a late stage. Um, and maybe you've still got some work at, on the right side of the board, so that's new work coming up. But if you see that there's a lot of uh, work piling up sort of at a late stage on the right side of the board, maybe it's violating a work in progress limit that you've set up there, then that becomes, that's really easy to see that it's violating that limit. And then the team can know, okay, let, you know what, let's not push that early, uh, the work that's already at an early stage, let's, let's kind of put a pause on that. Let's not focus on pushing that forward because there's still a lot of stuff that's already close to being done on the right side of the board. So it becomes easy to see that and you can use those work in progress limits. Uh, also the, the neglected work thresholds, which will tell you when work has been sitting in that status for too long. So uh, like as an example, you could set up a threshold for a, say the, the BTR where you're scheduling these calls with the customers. Well, maybe it's okay if it sits in the scheduled status for three weeks, that's not a problem. If you've you know you've done your job, you got it scheduled out. There's nothing more to do until it's time to do that work. Go ahead and it's you know let it sit in the scheduled column for three weeks. But when it's time for following up after the the meeting occurred, it's only acceptable if that stays in that status for two days, right? We don't want it to sit in three weeks before they hear from us again after that meeting. That limit is just two days, so you can set that up for different columns to make sure that you are uh, you're able to see the what work is violating any of those thresholds and that needs some special attention to, to get that moving forward. So there's some of the ways that, uh, some of the advantages there of the specialized boards. Uh, some questions you can ask to identify some the work that might be, might lend itself to this sort of board would be some questions like this. Okay, so uh, could you 
Could you ask users to complete a form that was just dedicated for this? Like if it's be um, an order form or something, okay, to order a part for a procurement. Okay. Is, could, could it be simplified enough so that there's just a form that customers could fill out? Uh, could you write an SOP for that? Or could you have a project template for that? So anything there where uh, you answer yes to a question like that, then those would be good candidates for using a specialized board for that. In fact, you might have that already. If you're using a project templates already in ConnectWise or Autotask or whatever, then though you can just look at that and say, oh, which one of these uh, projects that would come from these templates we already have uh, would be useful to track in this way? So you might already actually have a have a decent start on that. OK, um, yeah, that wraps up the specialized boards part. Any any questions at, about that at all? No, not yet. OK, all right. Well, I hope you can uh, make use of that. It is a advanced technique. Uh, you know, what? I, I shouldn't call it too much like a, a, an advanced technique. It's not. It's a special technique. It's not particularly hard. Um, most people wouldn't use that on uh, when they are just, you know, very first time that they're in the very first weeks of using top left. So maybe not the sort of thing that you do right away. But I would urge you to keep this in your back pocket because it could come in useful as you kind of get more experience with using top left. OK, now I want to just take a look at the basic um, some of the metrics that you can track in top left. So top left does let you track some basic metrics. You may have seen these things. An example of this in top left where uh, it can count the number, like total number of tickets here in a column, 270. You can uh, say, OK, it's got 91 tickets. that have some sort of error in it. That's just an example of some of the metrics that you can keep there. It can also track what's like the average age of the tickets in that column, 29.8 days. Okay. Um, that's useful stuff. It's, it's fairly basic, but it's useful. Uh, if you want to get more sophisticated, though, we do have an integration with a company called Nave. It's at getnave.com. And uh, they make uh, charts and dashboards tracking some pretty sophisticated metrics. Uh, you know, they, they also uh, integrate with Jira and uh, Trello and uh, uh, Asana and other board uh, things that have Kanban boards. And uh, we can send data to them as well. So let me just give you an example of some of the charts that you can get to really understand your workflows a lot better when you use Nave. So here's an example here. I hope you can see it here. This is one of the charts that you can get out of Nave. So this is called a cycle time scatter plot. And what this one is showing you, uh, th basically, th this is a, a board that shows you uh, some data about your tickets when at the time they're closed. So this one uh, is showing us when tickets are closed, how long have they been open? And what's that trend over time? So these would be like for the, the tickets that you closed yesterday, how long were they open? So one was open like five days, six days, you know, 20 days. You can also show you, uh, so, you know, being a scatter plot, it's really good at showing you some of the, uh, the outliers here and also the trend. So this green line represents the trend. So you can tell, are we doing better at closing our tickets faster. It can show you, okay, like half of your ticket, here's your 50% threshold, here's your 85% of this or less, and so on. So it's really good. Uh, there's a, quite a bit of information there. Uh, another one would be the cycle time breakdown chart, as they call it. So that would be when tickets are closed, what proportion of their time had been spent in each stage. That's really useful because it can show you how long has your ticket spent in, for example, in progress versus in queues. It might show you that your tickets have been in uh, you know, they, even if they're only in progress for a day, they spend six weeks in a queue somewhere. So that's not great. So that would, uh, it can tell you that sort of thing. Uh, they can also have a, they also have a cycle time histogram that tells you what proportion of our tickets are closed within a certain number of days. Also with the percentiles, you know, like 50% of our tickets are closed in X days or less. Uh, they have something called the throughput run chart that tells you how many tickets have we, have we been closing every day and what's the trend over time. Another one called a throughput histogram that says what, it's hard to describe this, it would be uh, what proportion of days do we complete a certain number of tickets? Also with percentiles. So that would be useful like to say, uh, you know, hey, maybe yesterday we closed 40 tickets. Seems like a lot, that's really good. But 
this chart would show you that that's really quite exceptional. You rarely close 40 tickets a day. It would tell you, for example, like 50% of the time, we, we only close 20 tickets or fewer. Uh, it has a um, also some Monte Carlo charts there in Nave. Uh, I have a hard time understanding what that sort of what even what that sort of stuff does. Uh, this one here would be uh, so this is a Monte Carlo delivery day. That would be if you give it a certain number of tasks, um, like all your open tickets right now and all your projects. What the what's the probability we can complete them by a certain date? So it's looking out into the future to say uh, what's the you know what with fifty percent probability what's the date that we could complete all those by? Or well, what if we want to be 95% confident? When are we going to complete those tickets by? It's got a couple of variations of those Monte Carlo charts. And then this one, or uh, I should say first, we have, there's something called an aging chart. That is about the, the number of tickets with their ages currently on the board. So that should, can show you, like currently with our tickets right now, uh, what are the oldest ones? And that can help you identify that um, uh, what, uh, well, you know, where are our outliers and what tickets do we need to deal with now because they've been open for a really, really long time. And then this one, this is called the cumulative flow diagram. This, as far as I'm concerned, this is like the crown jewel of agile charts. So there's a lot of data in here. It's really dense, but um, it can be a little bit confusing to look at for the first time. So let me try to explain it a little bit. So uh, it tracks the cumulative number of tickets that you have gone through your system, including closed tickets for a certain period of time. So that would be why it's called the cumulative flow diagram. So like the dark blue section here would, it would count like how many tickets have been closed uh, over this period of time. So the, the right edge here represents today and the left edge represents some time ago. Um, you know, stretching back into the past here. And so kind of the, the diff it would say here, okay, on the day we started tracking, it had whatever that is, like 30 something closed tickets. And uh, in total now there's been 350, something like that, I can't have a hard time reading that, but say like 350 closed tickets in total in that period of time. Um, and then these other colors each represent a stage of the work. So basically a column on your Kanban board and then how many tickets were in each of those columns on that date. So it can tell you a few things, interesting things about your work here. So it can tell you on one hand, like how much variation is there in our workflow? And you, that would be demonstrated by particular spikes or troughs or like flat periods in this. So we can see here, like here's sort of a trough, not much got done there. Uh, this is a, a, a steep slope here. So a lot got done there. Uh, again, here's kind of a flatter part and then another steep slope. So it's, this one is not a really great example of a very consistent workflow. There's definitely times where more work gets done and then less work gets done. So again, it can pretty, I mean, you can see that just at a glance. That's um, a good use of this board. Uh, it can answer how many, like how many tickets did we have in each column each day? Uh, it can say, what was the cycle time on a particular day? Basically like for a, t a ticket on that day, how long has it been open? until it gets closed. And so that you can tell like from the horizontal distance here between uh, where the color starts and where it gets to complete it. So it can measure measure that. Um, a, a less distance here represents tickets being closed faster. And it can also tell us things like, are we basically like, are we winning overall? You can tell that with these black dashed lines here. So it counts here from the kind of the start of the start of the period total number of tickets that are open going up to that point there. And then here, how many tickets are closed over the whole period? And uh, if these lines are parallel, it means that basically over that period, you haven't made any change. The same number of tickets were open and cl versus closed uh, at the beginning of the period versus the end of the period. But if these black lines are kind of moving, uh, um, if they are converging, getting closer at the end here, that means that you are winning overall. You're uh, making progress in that you are closing more tickets in your uh, opening. If they're diverging, and you can kind of, if you look closely, you can tell us diverging just a little bit here. It's not too bad, but it is diverging a little bit here. So um, we are overall in this period, we're not winning. We are getting more tickets opened than we're closing on average throughout this whole period. So might be some cause for concern. You might want to think about that. 
and it's really good. You know, you can see that just at a glance if you understand what you're looking at. So um, this is a really powerful chart. Uh, you saw some of the other examples. I explained some of those other examples. So uh, yeah, just be aware you can get this stuff plugged into Nave. And uh, they have a two week free trial and really reasonable pricing. It's not even per user, it's like per dash, per Kanban board essentially. And it's quite reasonable in my opinion. So uh, that can be a good use for, a, a good way to get some good insight into your workflows. Okay. Um, yeah, so it kind of wraps it up. Your homework for this week would be to get more people using top left. So now, now you got those demo licenses. So go ahead and get your team using top left. Uh, and then think about how you could use this for one specialized workflow. You might even try setting it up in top left there. Think about, uh, you know, look, go, go and look at your project templates that you have and see if there's one that would be a good use for a specialized workflow and go ahead and try setting that up. That would be a good, uh, good use of some of what we've learned here this week. And uh, that brings us to the end. So um, yeah, I wanna thank you for listening to me for four weeks. Glad that you came. I hope that it was valuable for you. Um, are there any questions at all about anything I, you know this week or any of the previous weeks? Matt, I do have some, but they're kind of case specific so i don't know if it's better if we have a catch up after um rather if than you have the if you have the questions now then go right ahead because that's what i'm here for is you know whether they're general questions or kind of specific questions yeah so it's it's more we're looking at this from a project focus um and my initial thoughts are maybe this is software is not going to achieve what i'm about to ask you so Maybe not. Um, we're looking to use this in a way to gauge an engineer's capacity over the coming weeks or months when they have big projects. So what I see Kanban does, it's not really about what's happening next week or in two weeks or in three weeks, in four weeks to display that information. Um, so if is, is there a way that we could you know, assign tickets, if if you like, to an engineer for a project to say they've got, you know, it's 100 hours of work in front of them um, and it's happening over this number of weeks. Is there a way to display that? Well, do you remember the scrum ban one from last week? I can bring that up. Because I can yeah, show, I can show you something. what we've got at the moment and what <laughs> we're looking for something similar. We did this horrible Excel spreadsheet. It's very manual. Um, certainly which not is the fine. only person people to have done that. Yeah. So you're you're bringing uh, yeah, up something. You're, you're more now, than yeah. welcome to, yeah. to share that. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. Was that week in advance? Yeah. Let's deal with that now rather than in the future. Yeah. Um, so. <clears throat> That is something that we we do want to add to the Gantt charts at some point. Uh, is starting to look at who's assigned to that. Yeah, I def definitely acknowledge that that is uh, that is necessary. I don't have an ETA for when we will be able to offer that, but it is on the roadmap. Yeah, uh, yeah, projects. I know probably a small part of a lot of MSPs, but we are we've got three project managers. We've got couple of hundred projects on the go. Um, it would be nice to be able to use this tool to display what we need to do because it's this close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, understood. Thank you for the uh, feedback. I guess and I'll, then I'll give you some context for that, see if we can get this feature, we can start utilizing that and then you guys can probably target any other big MSPs. Uh, much easier to get a 300 license sale versus, you know, 10 at each time 30, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's good feedback. And definitely we'll be considering when to 
when to get that in? So given, um, given I guess, first focus, there are, we love this for client services. The feedback I get is it's great and clients are getting access to the portal. So it looks like it's, it's in. Um, maybe you could use us as a development case. Look at the sort of data we um, uh, we we want and would like to get out of it. I I know it's it's not a Kanban board. I do acknowledge that um, that what we're looking for is not agile. Um, but most projects that we do don't lend themselves to being agile. They are you know preparing something to give a final product at the end. That's really what it is. We can't give them half a server. We can't give them half an exchange migration. We can't give them half of this, half of that. It's when are we getting our thing? That's it. Um, software development is different, which is where Agile is just absolutely brilliant. You can slowly add features as you go along. But for the stuff we do, not all the time, but typically, it has to be one big thing at the end. There's a deliverable that we have to do, and we can't give them half. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to, we, we have a different opinion. Like, that's why we offer this training. You, it's not a good practice to just deliver 100% of a project all at the end. You should Small. be cutting it into smaller milestones and deliver them bit by bit. I mean, I'm aware that you we can't do. give us a single exchange server, but that's the wrong scope to think of it. All right, I'm no, sorry. So you, like, you a big project. Half an exchange server, but you need, like, maybe that's one milestone then, because obviously you can't give them half of a server. But hmm. if it's a big project, then that is one milestone, something that can get plugged in on its on its own. Like it can actually, you know, it's an improvement. It's not the whole thing that they need, but it is some element of improvement. And that's the that's the agile thinking, right? And it, like, because we strongly believe that you are you give better service to your customers when you start thinking in that in those terms. Because then sometimes there's sometimes you can. not like a, a good service provider will dig pretty deep into what the customer needs and then figure out, okay, what, you know, there's like eight different parts of this big project. Well, which parts are the most impact to the customer? Let's figure that out and do those parts first. Because maybe they're like uh, the seventh absolutely. and eighth thing. No, like we they do. don't care if they get that in three months or six months. It's just not a big thing to them. They need it, but they don't care when. But then we yeah. focus on delivering them the things that are the most important to them, the soonest, where we can actually be more confident about um, the timing of when we deliver those. Yep, absolutely. We do we do milestone work and we do put them in the order the customer wants, et cetera. It's the, um, there is things where we need to forecast dates out in the future. That's, uh, I can't see a other way of saying it. There's a, you know, it, it, and, and yes, there might be 10 milestones in a project, but each of them is a discrete, thing that has to happen and you can't give them half a milestone it's it has to be a milestone you know uh, so uh, typical one would be where you're really going into the office 365 environment and intune is one part of it um autopilot is one part of it the exchange migration is one part of it the sharepoint migration is one part of it we they are separate things and they can be done we can do that and we can do that and we can do that and we can do any order they're just things that have to be done um, and we need to put dates on them in the future. That's our clients are asking for that. We can't say, well, you know, we're working on it. It'd be nice if we could. Okay. Well, you know, you, uh, you do need some dates and I did show you the way that you can do that on the scrum band board. So it's not a Gantt chart. Mm. Maybe you got to educate your customers a little bit on what that, what that looks like, but I can give you like the important 80% of what you're asking for. It, it won't look like what you're like, if you just want to keep doing what you always did, I don't know. But if you want to, you, you know, if, if you are willing to change a little bit and maybe show them again, uh, show them a Kanban board, it's, it's not the Gantt chart that they're used to. That's true. But it being able to do that makes, gives them most of what they need and makes your job way easier. I agree. Lynn, let's educate our customers. We'll get to the projects when we get to them. <laughs> that's, uh, that's not what that's I'm saying. That's how I look. 
that's, 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 if that's what you're hearing, then I'm miscommunicating badly. I just mean, no, no. if the Scrum Ban Board says you're going to get to something like in the second month out, then, then, uh, and maybe, maybe with maybe, uh, let's say the third month out, uh, where you don't need to be so precise, like because the precision three months out is a fantasy. No, I totally agree. And, and yeah. if your customers are asking for that, it's your job to say, like, nobody can do this. There's not an MSP in all of Australia that can confidently tell you when you're going to get something three months out. And I think your, your, I mean, your customers can understand that. Maybe they've come to you because they've got a bad experience with other places and all they're looking for is somebody to educate them a little bit. <clears throat> I just want to make your job easier so that you can kind of embrace the idea that being precise for something that's three months out is just a fantasy. It's working for other MSPs. <clears throat> Obviously, you use better language when you're actually talking to your customers. Uh, but you say, yeah. hey, like yeah. this is... Um, you know, th this is how we do it. Like, I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to try to confidently tell you the dates on something that's three months out. We've found that doesn't work. We're, um, you know, but this is, uh, this is where we think, you know, and you also split it out into the things which are firm, you know, because like, they might legitimately have things. We, we talked about this last week, I think. They, they will have some things that legitimately they have to happen by a certain date. And you say, this is how we manage that. They put a due date on the ticket and we, so that we can see, like, this has a firm due date. Uh, even if it's just because your contract you signed with them says it will be done, like, because um, you can have more than one type of contract with them. Um, and you say, hey, like, that'll give them a ton of confidence. If you can demonstrate to them to say, hey, this is how we know we're going to do, like, we, we are aware of the bits of this project that have a very firm due dates. And we're aware of the parts that don't have such firm due dates, and this is how we're going to manage it. That will give your customers quite a lot of confidence. And in fact, it'll be a better experience for them because when things change, as they inevitably do, that's kind of the thinking behind Agile is that it's inevitable. You can't just de declare something's going to happen on a certain date. Um, so when things change, as they inevitably do, you will... Um, they will have been warned about that because you didn't tell them three months ago that something was going to happen firmly on a certain date. Three months ago, when you were talking about it, you said, you know, this is our good estimate now and things might change. Yeah. I, look, I, you kind of preach into the converter with putting dates. Um, it's something I guess we'll, so Lynn is the, the head of the department that we need to talk with Lynn and, you're right, if your customers are educated at the start, maybe that's the thing we need to do um, because you're right, three months out, you know, you've had 10 P1s across that with other things. So the engineers haven't done what they were supposed to do in a particular week. So yes, it stretches out and it is a standard thing. Um, yeah, okay. I, yeah, I get it. I, it's not something I can say we're going to do because it's it's bigger than me. Um, I'm I'm aware. Yeah, I, I and I know it's difficult. And it, educating your customers is not just something like only a project manager alone can do, right? It's got to start at the beginning with your sales, right? It's like a whole, your basically your whole company. At least that that you know, that part of the company has got to be on board with this sort of thinking. That's um, so, it's difficult. It is, but it, it really provides a lot of rewards for those who decide that, yeah, we can do this. We're not just going to say customers must have this, um, but we're going to, no, we're going to think about how we can do this because we see the value in it, including if we have to start educating customers a little bit, which is a challenge. <laughs> it is. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Gantt chart side of things is the... Um... They want it to the end. And that's what we're promising in the sales cycle. They're promising that, um, yeah, we'll schedule this out. And you're right. When you have a project that's bigger than, you know, a day's work, things happen yeah. in between. Um, yeah. uh, other projects come in that are a higher priority because something's going to break if you don't do them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's a good, like, it's, I'm glad you mentioned that. Like, if that kind of demonstrates what I just said like if your salespeople are promising certain things well then yeah you're not going to be able to go back on that are you 
Uh, so it's got to start with the whole company or, you know, that, that part of the company. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, that was really good. Um, yeah, yeah. I hope, it is I hope good we get software. something out of it. Yeah, it is. It is good software. Um, thank you for the demo licenses as well. Um, they came through.